Want to be happy? Build a life, not just a business. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know you've got something more inside you too. You have Michael Jordan level genius at something. So today, let's live your best believe life and learn these seven genius habits that will improve your life. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with habit number one. Track your expenses with David Bach. I would teach this and I would tell people, you need to track your expenses for 30 days. For 30 days, go track your expenses. And like two people did it, right? <laughs> so then I was like, okay, you know what? The seven day challenge. In fact, I think we did this on, we did this on Oprah. Yeah. You know, for seven days, track your latte factor. Oprah, when I did the one of the Oprah shows, she, we, we showed the latte factor and she pulled off a cloth and showed this woman's latte factory and we had a quarter of a million dollars in cash wow. sitting on this table and we told people for seven days track your expenses a lot of people did that like tens of thousands of people tracked their expenses for seven days so i would love it if people would go and take the challenge and for seven days track where their money's going everything you know People are like, well, does that include cash? Yes. Does that include my ATM card? Yes. Checks? Yes. Visa, everywhere your money goes for seven days, track it. And then at the end of seven days, look at it and tell yourself, well, what's in here that could be changed? Now, I will say this. Some people can't get through seven days. Really? So, really. So a lot of times, and I could do it right now, I say, you know what? Just do it for one freaking day. <laughs> one day. One day. Just take one day and take a pad of paper and just write down where your money goes for one day. And the only key here is don't change who you are during that day. Don't go, you know, don't change your behavior. Just spend money like you always do. And if, again, if you're in a relationship, have your partner do this. Mm. And then look at it and, and be honest with yourself. You know, I always think Benjamin Franklin was famous for saying a penny spent, a penny saved is a penny earned. Well, today I'd say five bucks saved is five bucks earned. Habit number two, have discipline with Will Smith. When you look at um, the athletes, right, there's a certain extreme mindset that you... I was gonna say you have to take on, I don't know that you have to take it on, but I do know is that in this society, um, we worship that mindset mm -hmm. that, um, you know, it's the, 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 can you become Michael Jordan mm -hmm. without that mindset? Yeah. You know, yeah. and that is, a, that is a really powerful, difficult question. It's like, most people can't sustain the mindset yes. that, you know, fortunately, because it's, <laughs> it can be so destructive, yeah. but most people can't sustain that level of discipline to manifest the things that they want in, in their life. And there's just a, there's a poisonous edge to that kind of discipline. And I've been to the edge of that kind of material world discipline in my mind. And I can tell you, you can have a whole lot of stuff and be miserable out there mm -hmm. on that edge. And I found a much more comfortable uh, and productive space in my life. And you still need that discipline. Yes. But it, it, it's like when, you're, when you use that kind of power to achieve things, it's like there's a uh, there's a there's a, 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 a brutal reckoning. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's a brutal reckoning yeah. at the at the end of that. Habit number three: cheer for yourself with Mel Robbins. Talk to me about chasing your dreams and this quote that you have that an aha moment does not necessarily lead to an aha life. Mm. Um, yeah, the Uber driver in Dallas that's in this book. Um, I get choked up when I think about him. Uh, an aha moment. Why choked up? I get choked up because what happens for me every single day is, and you hear from people every single day, you've got millions and millions of people that are inspired by, empowered by, impacted by your content. There are people out there that use your work as a lifeline and it is humbling. And what I am really present to 
in the work that I'm putting out and the stuff that I'm sharing, whether it's my failures or the things that I'm using that are helping me in my own struggles, is just how much people are holding themselves back Mm. and how much pain people feel. Because most folks know what they dream about and what they want. And yet they're spending all of their time and energy arguing against what they want. And so you can have all these epiphanies. I hope that when somebody listens to our conversation and watches this, that they have a massive aha moment. But it's not going to mean if you don't take action and do something about it. The aha moment is the door that opens, but your new life does not begin unless you step through the door. And most people, and that's what was so kind of, you know, the simple idea of high-fiving yourself, of encouraging yourself, of supporting yourself. Most people, when you have an aha moment and the door to your new life opens up, Instead of going, I got this, let's go, and high-fiving yourself to step forward, most of us go, "Mm, I don't know if I'm worth it. I don't know if right now is the right time to do this. I don't think I'm good enough. I failed so many times, I can't go through that door. And that's the problem I want to attack right now, that there is somewhere in your life that you know what you want. You can feel it pulling you and you are actively arguing against it. You're bringing yourself down. You're beating yourself out. Like people will cheer for you and me, they won't cheer for themselves. I'm the same way. And so this Uber driver, the story that you're talking about, I get into the car and we start driving and I'm on the phone as we're driving and I'm having a conversation with somebody about this daytime talk show that I launched, which was a dream with Sony Pictures Television and then uh, was promptly fired after season one. It was a huge failure because we didn't make it to season two. Huge failure in real world terms. Right. Massive success when it comes to the timeline of my life. And so I'm talking to this person about the talk show. I hang up the phone and this Uber driver comes alive. He's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're in my cab. And I'm like, why? And he says, because I I wanna talk to you about something. I think you can help me. And I'm like, great, how can I help you? And he says, I have a dream of being a Oscar winning uh, actor and creating opportunities for other black and Latino men to do the same in acting. And I'm like, freaking fantastic. What the are you doing in Dallas, <laughs> right? You know, the guy's 25. And so I, I go, you know, the game is in New York and LA. I mean, sure, you can act, you can write stuff, you can be here in Dallas, but why are you not in LA? Why are you not in New York? And he's like, you're right, you're right, you're right. I need to move to LA. I'm like, why not? And he says, I have $700 in my bank account. And I'm like, that's freaking fantastic. You have $700 in a car? Dude. Drop me off and get driving. What are you waiting for? And so we have this whole conversation, and I write about it in this book, where I am actively arguing for his dream. And he is actively arguing against his dream. And what is so sad is throughout this conversation, Tom, he's like, you're right. $700 could get me there. You're right, I am only 25. You're right, if I keep thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking about what I wanna be doing, I'm not only gonna drive in circles, my whole life is going to spin in circles as I think about what I want and I don't do shit about it. And then you are going to find yourself, not at 25, but at 45 or 65, and you're gonna be so filled with regret that you never put put a bet on yourself. And so this conversation ends with him declaring that he's going to go to California and me giving him a bunch of tools that I talk about in this book. And the point of the story is, does he move or not? I don't know. The point of the story is it's so easy to see what somebody else should do. It's so easy to cheer for somebody else. We all do that, right? We cheer for our favorite sports teams, we follow our favorite influencers and authors, we plan birthday parties for our friends, we take on extra work from our colleagues, we support everyone around us. We do not know how to do it for ourselves. 
Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Habit number four, be an infinite student with Simon Sinek. How do you create the environment where people are going to thrive and create those results that you're talking about? What does it, you're asking me the question, um, uh, what does it mean to be healthy? You're asking me the question, what does it mean to be a great parent? Like, I don't have five things to be a great parent, right? It's a lifestyle. And it's, it comes number one with the commitment that I am responsible for the life of another human being, the growth of another human being. The closest thing to leadership is parenting. You have to be an infinite student of parenting. You know, you want to be a parent, you ask your friends, you ask your own parents, you join groups, you read magazines, you watch talks, whatever it is, you're constantly consuming how to deal with this constantly changing challenge of being a parent. And it's ups and downs and successes and failures, you know, and that's what it is. Leadership is the same. Leaders, great leaders are students of leadership. No matter how achieved they may be, um, they're still learning. Um, and it's a lifestyle. It's the lifestyle of what I need to do to look after people, which includes things like listening, uh, learning how to give and receive feedback, um, learning how to have effective confrontations, how to discipline when necessary in a way that's constructive. Um, roam the halls, get to know people, learning what it means to, to ask somebody questions. How do you ask questions? You know, like some people are naturally good at being curious about other human beings and some people are uncomfortable because they're introverts or whatever, socially awkward, but we can learn, you know? How do you learn to remember people's names? Oh, I'm bad at names. No, you've just decided you're bad at names. We can learn to be good at names so that when we walk down the hall and say, hey Tom, oh my God, he remembers my name. It's a nice feeling. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. There are many, many things we have to do and constantly work on to be a great leader to create that environment. Habit number five, step out of complexity with Jamie Wheel. The World Health Organization has now established that more of us globally take our own lives than war, tornadoes, earthquakes, floods, famines, and plagues combined. We have become our own worst enemy. In fact, the pressures of trying to survive and thrive in the world as we know it and live it today is so great that a million of us a year opt to step off the mortal coil rather than continue to try and face it and fight it. And there have been many think pieces in this last year in particular about this notion of diseases of despair, right? How a particularly for displaced middle Americans, demographics typically 40 and up, often without college degrees, frequently wondering, I mean, here we are at SU, right, talking about this bleeding edge of future disruption. They've been disrupted. They don't see a world where they have a part in it. And they're dying of despair. They're dying of these diseases of despair, as they are called, but maybe, Maybe they're not diseases at all. Maybe they're symptoms, symptoms of a larger problem that we can't quite put our fingers on. And what that problem might be is that we, our brains and our minds and our bodies aren't built for this shit. Millions of years of evolution, right? Slow paced, acute, present, embodied, very low bandwidth realities, very high consequence for not being present in this exact moment. And now we're facing a world where, so if you think, from all of human history until 2012, every bit of information ever created, the, the libraries at Alexandria, right, every song, every story, every scripture and sacred text, all of it, 
from the dawn of time until 2012, we now generate that much data every 48 hours. So we are drowning in information and starving for motivation. Oh, somebody, somebody gets a red flag. Where was that little phone going off? <laughs> Goodness gracious. Um, and what's happening is three things. Volume, what we just talked about. Velocity, how fast it's coming at us, right? And complexity. Because what's happened between the 20th century and the 21st, and I know you guys are all deeply vested in exactly this nut to crack is that we've moved from complicated problems. How do you do Kaizen in a factory and get a, you know, a million cars off with good quality control and a good price point? How do you get the trains to run on time? You know, thank you, the Swiss, right? How do we solve for lots of moving parts, but not that much ambiguity, right? Ultimately, there's, a, there's, there's an app for that. There's a manual for that. But what we've done is we've stepped across that chasm and we've now entered the world of complex problems. And if you attempt to continue to solve complex problems with merely complicated process, you create, wouldn't you know it, more complications. Habit number six, sleep with Matthew Walker. What we've discovered over the past um, 10 or 15 years is that you need sleep after learning to essentially hit the save button on those new memories so that you don't forget. So sleep will actually um, future-proof that information within your brain. But recently we've discovered that you not only need sleep after learning, you also need sleep before learning. And now to actually prepare your brain, almost like a, a dry sponge, ready to initially soak up new information. And without sleep, the memory circuits of the brain essentially become waterlogged, as it were, and you can't absorb new memories. Let me show you um, the data here. So here in this study, we decided to test the hypothesis that pulling the all-nighter was a good idea. So we took a group of healthy adults and we assigned them to one of two experimental groups, a sleep group and a sleep deprivation group. Now the sleep group, they're going to get a full eight hours of shut eye, but the deprivation group, we're going to keep them awake in the laboratory under full supervision. Um, there's no naps, there's no caffeine, by the way. Uh, it's miserable for everyone involved. And then the next day, we're going to place those participants inside an MRI scanner. And we're going to have them try and learn a whole list of new facts as we're taking snapshots of brain activity. And then we're going to test them to see how effective that learning has been. And that's what you're looking at here on the vertical axis, the efficiency of learning. So the higher up you are, the more that you learn. And when you put those two groups head to head, what you find is a quite significant 40% deficit in the ability of the brain to make new memories without sleep. I think this should be frightening considering what we know is happening to sleep in our education populations right now. Um, just to frame that in context, it would be the difference between acing an exam and failing it miserably, 40%. And we've gone on to discover what actually goes wrong within the brain to produce these types of learning disabilities. And there's a structure that sits on the left and the right side of your brain called the hippocampus. And you could think of the hippocampus like the informational inbox of your brain in that it's very good at receiving new memory files and then holding on to them. And when we looked at this structure in those people who'd had a full night of sleep, we saw lots of healthy learning-related activity. Yet in those people who were sleep-deprived, we actually couldn't find any significant signal whatsoever. So it was almost as though sleep deprivation had shut down the memory inbox and any new incoming files, they were just being bounced. You couldn't effectively commit new experiences to memory. And habit number seven, the last one before some very special bonus clips is live in a state of meditation with Guru Gopal Das. What does someone like you mm -hmm. do to meditate? How do you meditate? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I came to the monastery, the meditation I was taught was mantra meditation, mm. which is chanting on beads. So mm. I chant a mantra. Mm. 
And as I began the process, I realized how challenging it was to be present into the sound of the mantra and to be totally in a space, in a zone of thoughtlessness where there's nothing bothering your mind and you're completely present and listening to the sound and totally absorbed, you know, in the sound. I realized that it was a massive uphill task. And I think it comes, that the challenge comes from the fact that we've got so used to multitasking mm. that our mind functions on 20 tracks. Mm. So when we're just on the meditation track, there are 19 other tracks to deal with. Yeah. You know, you have your personal life, you have relationship issues, you have your professional issues. There's so many things going on. You have issues coming from family, so much going on in the country. There's so much that's occupying our mental space. Mm. And when you actually want to get onto the track of meditation by kind of just putting all of this in the back seat, it becomes practically impossible. Mm. And a lot of people tell me this. Mm. And when they're trying to meditate, this is what happens to them. Mm. And I share my journey with them. This is exactly what happened to me when I started. Mm -hmm. It's been 25 years now. Every single day without one day's gap, one and a half, half hours every day. And I, and I tell them that it's not that it's not a challenge today. It would be very high-headed to say that, okay, I've reached a state of enlightenment. When I sit for meditation, everything's kind of there and I'm totally absorbed. Very high-headed, I feel, to say that. But I did a few things that I feel can benefit those who want to really get into that, a deeper state of meditation. I I look at meditation in two ways. A is the meditation meditation as in the practice. And B is everything that we do in our life as meditation. Mm. You know? And I prefer to work more on everything in my life as a meditation, which feeds into my practice of meditation. 100%. But you do know? not neglect the practice. No, the do not neglect the practice, for sure. Yeah. So, uh, I'll tell you what I do, for instance. Uh, one meal a day, I just eat by myself. Two meals I take with my friends, my, some of my monk, monk friends, where we discuss, chat, eat. One meal is just by myself. The reason being, I want to be present, mindful, in the moment, to savor the entire experience of touching, feeling, smelling, tasting that food. I avoid forks and spoons as much as is possible because I want to touch mm. and feel that experience of the food. Mm. Now, the reason I do it is because it just means no phones, no books, nobody to talk to and just being there eating. Correct? So what I'm doing is by just eating that one meal by myself, training my mind mm. to be in the present. Like we are talking now. There's three meetings lined up for me tonight. Mm -hmm. And there's a restaurant called Candy and Greens at Breach Candy. The family is a very close friend, you know. So they've just opened up a new rooftop terrace. I've been getting message after message. Could you come down today evening for dinner? Right. But it's not on my mind. It's not on my mind. Nothing outside of our conversation between you and me right now is on my mind. So why, why do I do it? It's because right now I'm training my mind to be in the present. Mm -hmm. When I used to be in the bathroom, I would sing. Like a big thing for me used to, of course, earlier I would sing a lot of cinema and movie songs. And now I sing some spiritual songs, bhajans, whatever. And then one day I realized, hey, wait a minute. This is not right. Because neither am I into the singing, nor am I into the experience of bathing. Mm. So if I'm singing, I'm missing the experience of bathing. Mm -hmm. And if I'm bathing... I'm not into my singing. Mm. So why am I doing two things at the same time? I stopped singing. Just focusing on the experience of the water coming down my body and experiencing that. So, so to me, these little things uh, through the day matter a lot to me. And I think that's, a, that's more of meditation to me. Mm. Because then what I do here feeds into my mainstream practice of meditation. Mm. And uh, what I do here feeds into the little things as well. So it's kind of a loop, mm -hmm. one feeding into other. The language you use about yourself when you're by yourself is what will make or break your self-esteem. When we talk to other people, when we post on Instagram, when we share our lives, we always wanted to, to look good and be amazing and be so positive, right? Most people's Instagram stories are 
or just all of these amazing highlights and how beautiful my perfect life is. And then you go home and you're by yourself and you look at yourself in the mirror and people, you know, cry themselves to sleep. What's the message when you talk to yourself? What's the message when you're alone? What are you saying about yourself? When you can start to fix that self-talk, that inner dialogue, that starts to shift everything inside you to then create amazing things outside you. I remember when I first got started making YouTube videos, my self-talk was uh, in conflict because I had my parents who I remember the voice, you know, there's a picture of my parents behind me on my wall in my office. And when people ask me, what's my favorite quote of all time? It's, it's what my parents used to tell me that I am Evan Castrilli Carmichael. I could do anything that I believe that I can. And that is a constant reminder that I still today, you know, at 41, still use, still tell myself, still remind myself of like, I am Evan Gostrilli Carmichael. I could do anything that I believe that I can. <laughs> and it's helpful and valuable and what a gift. Um, so grateful for my parents for that. When I was getting started on YouTube though, the other voice that was in my head was, you're introverted, you're shy, you suck on camera. Um, anybody who makes videos has a big ego, just needs to be famous. And so I really struggled with that because I had competing voices in my head. It wasn't even what other people were telling me to do. It was me, myself, when I'm by myself, thinking about myself, that constant inner struggle with the voices in my head left me struggling left me making super slow progress Left me started and stop it and started and stop and if you look at my videos i started and then i took big breaks and then i started again then i took more big breaks and it wasn't until i solved that inner conflict that i started to get more results and i started to be more uh productive and i started to stop stopping i started to stop stopping i stopped procrastinating i just did it because I wasn't so caught up in my head and the discussion and the inner dialogue and the voices. And I just replaced it with better thinking about myself, better messages to myself. I think when you can do that, your life starts to change because it's not other people's opinions that we, that really shape us. It's other people's opinions that then influence our own self-talk that then that's what shape us. The world that we're all living in is our own construction. And I think that's the thing that people are missing. We have literally created this world. And if this world is delusion, if this world is destruction, if this world is filled with more bad than it is good, then that is a process of our thinking. That is a revelation of how our minds work. It is a revelation of what we have built internally. So as Leo Tolstoy said, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing themselves. If we're actually gonna make change in the world, if those things that you have in your mind, the vision of what you want to bring to the world, all of the ills that you want to correct, if you're actually going to correct them, you have to look inward and begin asking, how is this your responsibility? What are the things in your thinking that have helped manifest this world, that have manifested the problems in your own life and that will, my friends, I promise you, manifest the solutions. And as Stephen Hawking pointed out, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge. We think we know something that we don't. We think we have the answers. We think within us already right now are the fundamental building blocks that we're going to need in order to build something new. But the truth is, the only thing that we already have is the willingness to look the willingness to change, to leverage the things that we have, but we have to build something entirely new. We have to understand that we don't yet know enough, that we are not adequate, that we have to look at ourselves and be willing to stare nakedly at our inadequacies and to adjust them, to fix them, to not hide behind ego, to not pretend or worse, believe that we're already who we need to be. Because the only promise I can make you is you're not yet the person you need to be to execute, to create the change that you want to make. But I can also promise you that you can become that. 
that if you're willing to do the hard work of looking internally and building something new, if you're willing to tear yourself down, if you're willing to brick by brick disassemble that thing that has been built by accident inside of you and move forward with a new level of intention and build something, an entirely new structure with your eyes open, with embracing and accepting a lack of knowledge, but never ignorance of not holding on to old ideas, but to ask of everything that you choose to believe, does this move me towards my goals or not? And if it does, then you do it. If it does, you believe it even more. But if it doesn't, right then, right there, you drop it. Then you make room for the new. Then you can build what you want to build. Then we'll have the change that we want. You know, I was in Thailand and I saw the Golden Buddha. And the story behind the Golden Buddha is they had, you know, the, the Thai people had this priceless object. And invaders were going to come into Thailand, so they got the idea to put layers of mud over the Golden Buddha. Uh -huh. And, you know, the invaders didn't find it. And, uh, you know, many, many centuries later, someone noticed this great monument of mud, <laughs> but there was gold you know, sparkling out of it. And so they went through the layers of mud and they found the golden Buddha. Wow. And I, the metaphor for all your amazing listeners and viewers is simply this. When we were born, we were born into possibility, awe and wonder, but through our parents' well-meaning and the media and our teachers and, and friends, society yeah. and our peers and the social media, what happens is we adopt the psychology of average versus the mentality of possibility and legendary. And as we continue to leave the perfection of childhood, we get hurt and we get disappointed. We don't get invited to a birthday party. We yeah. lose a love. We get stepped on. We say, I want to be an astronaut and I want to be a... I want to be a billionaire and I want to also be a great chef and I want to be a yoga teacher and the, our teacher or our friend says, ha, 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 you're a fool. Here's what the 45 day quit rule is. And it's hard for me. I hate this one. I look at all my big project ideas. You know, I don't know about you, but I have a journal with all my big ideas in it, you know, or I have my vision board or I have an Excel spreadsheet of all these different ideas and projects I want to do. And I've, I've got like, you know, right as an example right now, I know my next six books I'm going to write. I know them. I know my next three campaigns I'm going to launch. I know them. But here's what I have to force myself to do. And I don't like it. I say, OK, if this is a major project that I want to do, even if it could lead to significant growth, if I'm not going to start it, listen to this, if I'm not going to start it in the next 45 days, it's off my plate until next year. And I push it to 2019. I literally just take it from my journal in my little bucket of things I want to do this year and I put it out into 2019 and I feel so mentally relieved. A lot of people have a lot of anxiety about the number of projects they have on their plate that they really want to do. And so what ends up happening is that anxiety leads to a lot of procrastination. That anxiety leads to a lot of poor prioritization because there's so much to do. They're like, oh my God, there's so much to do here, so I won't do any of it. Ever had that? Have you ever found yourself in front of Netflix going, oh my God, I have so much to do, but I just watched the fourth video in the third season. Has that ever happened? You have so much to do, and that's the problem. You have so much to do that you haven't prioritized what you are going to do so you don't do anything. So what I do is this time of year, I look at all those things that are on my plate and I get honest. Which ones am I going to start in the next 45 days? And if I'm not going to start in the next 45 days, pop, put it in 2019. Now it's not even on my mental concern. It's not even on my dashboard. No anxiety there. No, oh my God, I still got to get that one in. Nope, it's gone. That's the 45 day quit rule. I encourage you to challenge yourself to try it. Patterns that have been reinforced for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. They're strong patterns. Mm -hmm. They're really strong patterns. Yes. So you don't change a 20 or 30 year old pattern in 20 days. Mm -hmm. 
by doing it 20 times or 30 times or 50 times when the other pattern has been recreated and reinforced oh, thousands right. and yep. thousands of times. Mm -hmm. You operate your whole day, your whole week, your whole month, your whole year based on the patterns that have been there, put there and reinforced. Yes. So what if I said you train your brain for 100 days and replace the old disempowering or negative or destructive patterns with a new pattern but deliberately yes deliberate it's mm -hmm. called deliberate conscious evolution i'm deliberately going to choose to change myself and if you committed to that think about what what would happen if we said let's say you're out of shape and we said you know what um let's go for a one minute walk every day mm -hmm. not an hour one minute yep so the first you know, week, we go, wow, this is easy. One minute walk. I, I can just walk around my house for a minute. Mm -hmm. Here's what I guarantee will happen. At the end of one week, so let's do a minute and a half. And let's do two minutes. And then yep. let's do three minutes. And then at 100 days, you might be at, let's say you're at an hour 100 days later because you actually enjoy it. What do you think would happen to your beliefs, to your confidence, to your physique, to everything, if you were to exercise gently, lightly for one hour a day, mm -hmm. change it your life. Completely transform. Yeah. So let's start with self-talk. Let's start with eliminating so our self-deprecating, you know, discussions with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if we want to change our limiting beliefs, why not start with asking what empowering beliefs do I want to have? Mm -hmm. And then what are ways that I could actually create that pattern in my brain? Mm -hmm. So reading an affirmation and s closing your eyes and actually feeling what that's like if it was true and how would you behave if that was true and what kind of comments would you get if that was true mm. activates not only the left prefrontal cortex of your brain, the occipital lobe part of your brain, the emotional part of your brain, and the motor cortex of your brain, but that is what it requires to rewire the brain with a new, more empowering pattern. Most of us are asking for things that aren't even clearly linked to what we are actually missing. And so I'll give an example of this. I have so many clients that I coach or so many people that I work with where the number one thing they want from their partner is time. They're like, I wish my partner had more time. Brendan, I, I wish they just gave me more time. Now, the amazing thing is me and Brendan are giving each other time right now, but what if I was like this the whole time? Right. <laughs> what if Brendan was writing another best-selling book at this time? And, and we kind of talk, but Im imagine we did that the whole time. Right. It looks like you're present there with them, but you're not when this is like the, this is like a force field between you, your phone, your, your, your task, your thing. I love that time. Yeah, yeah. that's so good. This, this could be a book. This could be a newspaper. This could be email, whatever it is. But it's interesting. People say I want more time. And so people come back from a weekend away and then they'll go back to their partner and be like, I wish we spent more time together. And the other partner's going, well, we just went away on a weekend. And they're thinking, but no, but you were at the beach and I was with the kids. And it, that wasn't. So what are people really asking for? I've realized that over this time, people are asking for three things when they're asking for time. They're asking for presence, they're asking for attention, and they're asking for intimacy. I constantly believe you gotta feed your mind and, and challenge your body, because the mind-body works together. You know? What stops people, as we said, is fear. Well, fear is physical. You feel it in your throat, your gut. But if you do something really physically strong on a regular basis, you develop a new emotional habit. And that emotional habit will get you to follow through and do things differently that people won't do. It's really not that complex. There are a few habits in your life that truly could change your whole life. I start every single day with this process called priming, training my brain to be in a peak state. Because we get primed all the time, you know, people aren't aware of it, but there was a study that was done not long ago where they took some people, 100 actors, they walked up to 100 people in a park, and they rehearse doing the same thing every time. They reach in their pocket to get their phone and they, or they hand the person a cup of coffee and then they reach in their pocket looking out and say, would you hold this to me for a second to a full stranger? And they grab their phone, look at it, type it, and they take it back. They go, thank you so much. The same for everybody. But then they come back 30 minutes later with somebody with, uh, and the only difference by the way is 50% of them have iced coffee, 50% oh, of them have hot coffee. Got it. Now a person comes by 30 minutes later with a clipboard, gives them $20 and said, if you'll give me literally a minute and a half of your time, to read this three paragraph story and answer these two questions, this is yours. 98% of people take the 20 bucks and do it. They read the story, same story for everybody. But 
half the people, when they ask them, the main character, how would you describe the qualities of the main character, the character traits? The ones that got iced coffee all say the person was cold and uncaring. 81% say that. Come on. The person that got hot coffee, 80% or 1% difference say the person is warm and genuine. And the only difference is 30 minutes earlier, somebody primed them. See, you think it's your thoughts. Much of your thoughts have been primed by the environment, by the media, by what you read to, by your family, by your friends, by your culture, by your background. So what I do every day is I prime myself for what I want rather than letting the environment control me. There is no such thing as a mistake. Everything happens in divine order. I am being guided to learn and grow. Here we go, people. When we look at the situations in our life from a place of regret, we ultimately miss the opportunity for growth. We miss the opportunity to see what could have been beneath that discomfort. We miss the opportunity to acknowledge and recognize that every experience in our life is not an accident. It doesn't happen by accident. It happens in a divine order. And when we live and lead and show up for our life grounded in that belief system, then we can face our most difficult moments with a sense of purpose and power. And we can show up for those moments with a opportunity to grow, focusing on the opportunity to grow, focusing on the opportunity for a shift, for strength, for spiritual awakening, for a new way of being and a new perception of our lives. So that's a lot. I know that's a lot. I know that when something really bad happens, like what we've been experiencing recently in the world, what we experienced in the United States last week, when we experienced something like a pandemic, we don't want to see the spiritual assignment. We don't want to see that this is not a mistake. But typically when difficult things happen, they are revealing what needs to be healed. These uncomfortable moments, whether they be global or they be personal, are revealing what we have to heal, whether we have to heal it on an individual level, which is where it begins, and what we have to heal on a global perspective and a global level. So showing up to all these uncomfortable moments and recognizing them that they are not a mistake, that they're happening in a divine order, and it's our opportunity to perceive these situations from the lens of what can I learn from this? How can I grow from this? How can I shift from this? How can I lean towards more love? How can I lean towards more joy? How can I lean into the lesson rather than the problem, the solution rather than seeking all of the faults and, and looking for all of the problems? Look at a lot of people don't embrace discomfort. It's like, well, it's not shocking. It's like, well, why the f would you? You've got 2 million, 2.5 million years of evolution telling you, don't be uncomfortable. That's a dumb ass idea. Your brain is screaming at you not to. So there needs to be this moment where you have this realization and tipping point that like, oh, always leaning into comfort is causing a problem in my life. And I have to push back against that. Because if you don't, you're just going to keep slipping. And we're seeing that with what's happening in society right now. I mean, just take the epidemic of obesity. I mean, that is the number one driver of health of health problems, of chronic disease. And it's like people today, we might be living longer than ever on average, but are we actually living? Like there's a difference between lifespan and health span. You know, if, if you really want to live a full life, you're not gonna look back at your life and be like, wow, I'm, I'm so glad that I watched Netflix and ate Domino's every night. Like, you're gonna look back at your life at the end of it and be like, man, I did some pretty rad shit. I did Spartan events. I climbed mountains. I did X, Y, and Z. Like, you need to reinsert these sort of uh, metaphorical lions back in your life if you really wanna live fully and um, be healthy as well. I think that if we share the same experiences, because mm -hmm. we like the same things, we share the same emotions. Mm -hmm. And if we share the same experiences, we share the same emotions, I can relate to you so we can exchange ideas and information. Yep. And if we share the same energy, energy is information. Mm -hmm. So many people, as an example, they use each other to reaffirm their their dependency on suffering. So I suffer more than you, then you say, I, you, I suffer, you suffer more than me. We, we have this thing, we just complain with each other. Well, that's the same resonance, the same frequency, and there's a match, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it goes to the same means if, you, if, you're, if you're 
someone who's has a, a uh, accountability partner that that you exchange ideas like this with, and it's a yeah. different frequency and different energy. So when energy comes together and it's constructive, something comes out of it. Yeah, you feel it, right? It's and you feel an elevation. If there's dissonance, then your your sensing meter is how you feel about that person. Many times in your gut or in your heart or wherever. And there's deconstruct, there's a, a destructive interference, and there's no energy involved. So, I think that's just a practice. But really, mm. the ultimate mastery is to be able to be in such resonance, such coherence, that when you walk in the room, that you raise everybody's energy, mm. and you don't let your energy drop because of any circumstance or any condition. And that would be greater than your environment, right? And that's mm. that's the model. Uh, that we use. So imagine 1,500 people in an event where everybody's getting super coherent and the interference that's going on in the room yeah. is creating these high amplitudes. Now we've measured that in the room and the energy in the room is off the chart many times. There's, I mean, there's energy for healing in there. There's energy for all kinds of things that can happen. So we brought it to life with our awareness. And so the more elevated the emotion, love, gratitude, freedom, bliss, ecstasy, the higher the frequency. Mm. So, but it turns out you can have a collective group of people with a lot of energy and be incoherent and it creates entropy. Yeah. You could have a smaller group of people that are highly coherent and put out a very big signal. Mm -hmm. So when we see a collective really get coherent, wow, the energy in the room opens up doors of possibilities that I would I would never expect. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know how to explain some of the phenomenological things that happen, but that's that's everybody's divine. Like everybody's everybody's in that state. They're they're in that elevated state. So I think our I think our our truth meter mm -hmm. is really whether we feel lifted uh, or we feel like uh, we've been robbed. Let's say that you wanted to build a better. Uh, I'll give you I'll give you an example: of breaking a good ha or building a good habit and breaking a bad one. So one of the laws is to make it obvious. And this largely comes down to like what we're exposed to each day, each day. And minimalism and simplicity plays a big role in this. Um, in the book, I call it environment design. That's basically the strategy. So for a long time, I realized that I brushed my teeth twice a day, but I didn't floss consistently. And when I looked at that habit, one of the reasons that I wasn't flossing consistently is because the floss was hidden in the drawer in the bathroom. So I just wouldn't see it, you know, like I wouldn't open up the drawer and, and remember. So I bought a little bowl and got some of the pre-made flossers and put them in the bowl and placed it right next to my toothbrush. So now I brush my teeth, put the toothbrush down, pick the flosser up, it's right there. Just that one little environment design change is pretty much all I needed to do uh, to build the habit of flossing every day. Um, on the other side, let's say, you know, a lot of people feel like they spend too much time watching TV or playing video games or just looking at a screen. But if you walk into pretty much any living room where do all the couches and chairs face? They all face the television. So it's like, what is that room designed to get you to do? It's designed to get you to watch TV. So there are a variety of uh, levels to this. You could, for example, uh, take the remote and take it off of the coffee table and put it inside a drawer, or you could take the television and put it inside like a wall unit or a cabinet so that you don't see it. Um, you could also increase the friction of the task. So you could like take the batteries out of the remote um, after each use. And then, you know, it's an extra five or 10 seconds to put it in. Maybe that's just enough time for you to think, I, do I really want to watch something or am I just doing this mindlessly? You could um, unplug the TV after each individual use and then only plug it in if you can say the name of the show you want to watch. So you can't like mindlessly browse on Netflix. And I mean, if you really wanted to be extreme about it, you could take the TV off the wall, put it in the closet and then only take it out when you really wanted to watch something. But the point here, and this is kind of the, the principle of environment design in general, which is you want to put fewer steps between you and the good behaviors and more steps between you and the bad ones. Letting go of energy that's clouding your vision and holding you back. It's a life practice that I learned long ago that has freed me whew, so many ways. It's a fact that holding grudges against somebody who's done you wrong or replaying, revisiting hurtful situations in your head over and over, only weighs you down and prevents you from being who you're meant to be right now. Because you're still energetically holding on to the past. The energy that you put into constantly rewinding to the resentment, why did they do that? Why did they say that to me? I didn't deserve to be treated that way. All of that only keeps you stuck it will never change what happened. You've got to press stop 
and reject the urge to keep replaying so that you can then fast forward into the now for yourself. You know, a lot of people think that holding on to things that disempowered them is going to somehow magically turn it around. Mm -mm. As I said in my message a couple of weeks ago about forgiveness, you have to release the notion, give up the hope that the past could have been any different. And you also must release the idea that people would do what you might do in any given instance. This is a big one. I had to learn and relearn before I actually got it. Expecting people to do what you would do in a situation only leads to your disappointment. Not theirs, they're going on with their life. So let people be who they are and either you accept it or you don't. Not doing that keeps you stuck in a circumstance that actually costs you time, costs you energy. And I can guarantee that oftentimes the person on the other side of the bitterness you're holding on to, they're not even thinking about you. In fact, they probably have just moved on. They certainly aren't obsessing the way you are. Think of it like letting go of any bad habit that just doesn't serve your well-being. Not an easy task. Taking the road to a more enlightened, healthy existence never is. So this is what I want to ask you to ask yourself. Why am I holding on to this? How is this serving me? And really think about the answer. Maybe it makes you feel validated. Maybe it makes you feel righteous. Or maybe taking on the pain is your way of recognizing the injustice so that even though it won't be made right, it can at least not be forgotten. Then I ask you, Again, ask yourself, do you want to be right or do you want peace? Woo, this was huge for me. The unfortunate fact is that having both may not be possible. And also you may never get your moment of righteousness, so why wait for it? Choose peace. What I know for sure is that in this world, time is a moving on and it's our most valuable commodity. You can never get it back. So staying in that loop, playing it over and over in your head of hurt only amplifies your pain. Let it go. Exhale, make room in your heart for something that is uplifting. Surround yourself with people who want the best for you. You have the ability to shift the DNA of your spirit and control how you perceive life. So why not lighten your load and let it go. Jesus told his followers, all the miracles that I can do, you can do them, but even better than I can, and you don't believe it. And that was the whole damn thing in a nutshell. <laughs> if you don't believe it, you can't do it. And I said, well, where's belief come from? Mind. I say, and then what have you been programmed you can't do? And I said, then you'll never be able to do it. And this is the problem. And, I, and so we talked about way number one. You want to change it? Mm -hmm. Hypnosis, because that's the original way things went in in the first place. And you're, you know, you, that what you said was true. Even you just say, I feel amazing. I feel amazing. If you repeat that, the mind will, will all of a sudden change how you feel. That's, that's how it does it. Okay. So I say, number one, self-hypnosis. Number two, after age seven, you still learn how to do new things that become habits. Like you didn't learn how to drive a car until, until later than seven. But once you know how to drive a car, remember the first day you got in, it was like, oh my God, looking out the windows, checking the mirror, watching the gauges, keeping your feet on the pedals just correctly, you know, looking, paying all these attention. It's like, ah. and I say, today you've been driving for a while. You don't even think about that. You get in the car, you put the key in, and now what are you thinking about? Well, what am I going to do when I get to the store? Mm -hmm. You're not even thinking about driving. Why? It's a habit. Okay. I say, well, how'd you get that habit? Because you're older than seven. How'd you get it? I said, repetition. That's what makes a habit practice you want to play an instrument i'll hand you an instrument yeah you didn't have any practice then you're not going to be able to play it and i say oh practice I say, what is that repetition that's the second way of the subconscious learns repeating something over and over and over again because that's called habituation making a habit and uh, i love it the new age today thing is fake it till you make it i go what the hell is that and i say you're not happy. Yeah, most of us have trouble being happy. And I say, but what if every day, all day long, and you can remember, you say, I am happy. In spite of the fact that what the hell is going on, you just say, I am happy. I am happy. I am happy. 
I go, why? What's going on? I say, repetition. And there'll be a point where you'll repeat it to the degree that the subconscious, which learns by repetition, will put in, I am happy. I say, then what's the consequence? They say, what's the function of the mind? Take that program and manifest it. Now that it's in there, I am happy. I wake up one morning, guess what? I don't have to say I'm happy. It's automatic. I'm already happy all day long. Why? My program said that. 95% is coming from that. Mm -hmm. Habituation you know, repetition of the exact thing you want, not future vision, as if you have it now, we'll put it in a program. So that's first seven years hypnosis, after seven years, uh, repetition, habituation is how you change it. Uh, a, a sticky note, people put that stuff on a mirror or someplace and they go, oh yeah, the little sticky note. And I go, that is not repetition. That's a suggestion. <laughs> a, a repetition is a practice. You have to repeat things. That's You practice an instrument, you practice driving a car, you practice doing these things, and then it became real. Okay, so the first two things are uh, hypnosis. Second thing is repetition. And thirdly, the most you know effective, uh, is called energy psychology. And I go, hmm. what's energy psychology? And I go, it's called super learning. I go, so what the hell is super learning? I go, maybe you've seen somebody read a book by picking up a book and just moving their finger down the page, just like that, just as fast as that. And guess what? The subconscious mind, the supercomputer that it is, has read every word just by moving your finger down and has read every word on that page. And a person using this super learning technique can go into a bookstore, open up a book, and five minutes later, by thumbing through each page, turn the page, turn the page, turn the page, they can read a whole book in five minutes. That's super learning. I say, if you can engage that function, you can also use super learning to create new programs not in days or weeks but you can create a new program in minutes <laughs> it's like i go absolutely and it's so important why because uh, there's an old phrase that's really critical it's called necessity is the mother of invention mm -hmm. and i say what's happening we're facing a mass extinction due to human behavior that is compromising the web of life humans are creating this through our behavior our culture i say you want to survive this epi this whole you know extinction event well then you have to create something different <laughs> you have to change behavior starts with you being completely honest with yourself on where you are right now in history where are you after covid where are you that the world has changed where are you with your confidence where are you with your income where are you with your career where are you with your happiness around those things? Where are you with your relationship? Where are you with your health, your connection to a higher power? There's lots of things we can use this tool for to get, complete honestly, uh, get completely honest, because let's just say it like it is, all change starts when you're brutally honest, that you're disturbed by standing still. You're disturbed by inaction. Think about it. That's how we move. That's how the rocket gets off the ground is being disturbed with leaving your life the way it is. So unfortunately, you're like, oh, now I'm listening to this podcast and I'm going to get disturbed. Yes, because if you're agitated, you move. Right. So let's pick your career, your income, what you do for a living. Where are you with that? Are you happy with your career? Are you happy with the business that you started? Are you happy that? You started the business, but it's not really going where you want. Listen, we all make decisions for one of two reasons. We're either moving away from something painful or we want to move towards something pleasurable, right? We either have to get out of this job or we lost our job or it's just toxic or it's not making me the money. I have to move or it's okay. It's not bad, but you know you have another level. You know God designed way more for you than you're doing. And the inaction of either one of those should disturb you, either away from the pain or towards the pleasure. So at any time, you could stop and write this down or come back at another time or type it in your phone. If you were being completely honest about your income, your career, uh, what you do for a living, starting the business or not, any of those, if you were completely honest, where are you? Because all change starts with a starting point, right? All directions on your GPS, you need the starting point. Where are you is the starting point now that the world has shifted. Sometimes, you know, things like COVID pull back the curtain and make us, make us really analyze our lives. And we don't want to go back to who we used to be. I get it. I see it every day. Okay. The next thing, if you know where you are now, then we have to decide where do you want to go now, right? 
Now, where do you want to go? That sounds like an obvious question. I want more success. I want more happiness. I want more joy. If it's not defined, if it's fuzzy, fuzzy targets don't get hit. We need a definitive plan. We need to know exactly what our compelling future is. We need that lighthouse to drive towards. And what is that for you? Most people know what they don't want. That's just the true story. Most people know what they don't want. They're avoiding potholes. They're driving away from problems, but they're not driving towards where they want to go. If you and I jumped in an elevator together and I said to you, hey, it's a year from now and it was the best year of your life. What's that look like? Where do you want to go? Would you be able to literally in four or five sentences tell me where it is you want and where you want to go? Or would you go, wow, good question, Dean. Let me think about it because that's what 90% of the people say. I've been asking people for over a decade. Mm, good question. Let me think about it. How do you know, how can you get to where you want to go if you don't have your GPS on where it is you want to be? I set a goal in 1973. I set a goal that I was going to build a company and upgrade all over the world. I had uh, left the Nightingale Cornet Corporation and decided that I was going to do this because I didn't agree with the way they were doing it. People weren't really learning it fast enough. Uh, they wouldn't get involved in the repetition. We were selling recordings, but the recordings weren't working because the people didn't understand how to use them. So I decided I would leave and start my own company. And I wrote down I'd build a company and operate it all over the world. I got a call last night from Mikey about nine o'clock, something like that. And uh, she told me that we were now in every country in the world. Now think of that. We had a broadcast going on here at 10 o'clock this morning. Some of you would be familiar with it. Some of you may have been on it. And uh, that broadcast had attracted thousands, literally thousands of people from every country in the world. The goal was reached. That move meant this is really accurate today. We're only limited by weakness of attention and poverty of imagination. Well, my imagination was pretty well exercised. I don't have any difficulty building huge ideas in my mind and just figuring out how to do it. Now stay with me here. The thing that's stopping you from taking the risk that you want to take is called a terror barrier. The way I'm going to explain this to you, I come up with sitting in a restaurant, I remember it was at a Holiday Inn restaurant, it was at Dixie and uh, just south of the 401 highway, in Toronto. A man asked me if I would meet with him. He had a problem and um, I was going to show him how he could solve the problem. And he explained it. So I took a pen and some paper. And what I'm going to show you here is essentially what I showed him. Now look at this for a moment. There is the process you go through when you're in a risk-taking vibration. You go from bondage to reason to the terror barrier, and then to freedom. This is something you taught me, is about really being unattached to the outcome, like being unattached to whatever it looks like, and knowing that if I keep focusing on my heart, if I keep focusing on giving, if I keep focusing on growing, if I keep focusing on loving people and loving myself, then I'm going to reject and attract the right things in my life, whether it be my relationships intimately, business partnerships, friends, you're going to repel people that don't want to be in that energy and you're going to be a magnet to beautiful things. Mm -hmm. And that's why like in the first time in my life, in my mind, I'm like, my mind is calm and my heart is at peace because I'm not attached to something needing to look a certain way. It feels beautiful. I went to Ironman, um, Ironman, Arizona, and I was spectating and I, I have no idea what his name is, but I watched the fourth place professional. He was either fourth or third come across the line. And this dude looked like you. I mean, he was yoked. And I was like, okay, you can look like an athlete and still have success in this, in this game. Mm. And so then I just really, cause I, my passion is truly like lifting and, yeah. and, and that, that's where, that's where my, I started and wrestling and fighting and all that. And so when I saw that dude, I was like, okay, I might be able to be successful in this sport. And I just fell in love with the, the, the diversity of it and the training. And then what I learned was a lot of this is mental mm. and going back to my roots was, 
was triath i mean what was was wrestling and again if i win or i lose it's my fault and i loved that and so i just started to implement um the mental side of stuff and the nutrition side of stuff and it just became this like big challenge for me mm. and over time it just escalated and I, I i would try one thing and i'd gain experience and and i um totally long story but i we lost everything in the economy i used to own yeah. a mortgage company and and all of these things happened and and i i remember doing my first ironman triathlon and um I just fell in love with it. And it, it, it was hard to have the perfect race. And again, it was like, I, I can do better. I can do better. I can do better. And you just keep going back to the drawing board, trying to do better. Mm -hmm. And I started working for a charity and it was a charity in Africa. And we ended up breaking the world record for the most half Ironmans done in a year. And, and it was so cool because it was the hardest thing I could think of. It totally pushed me physically and mentally. And, and as you know, the number one question that a lot of people get that, that a lot of people ask or want to know in today's day and age is like, how do I become more mentally tough? It's like, how do, and I'm like, well, you have to show up. A lot of people don't read because they're afraid of books. The books aren't their friend. So you might want to get a few books and kind of make them your friend. Um, you can start with simpler books, you know, like fiction. There's lots of good fiction writ written for adolescents and children. It's pretty straightforward. You can start there. If you're interested in philosophy, there's lots of simple guides like the Idiot's Guide to um, different topics or a beginner's guide. I read those things all the time when I'm first investigating a new topic. You know, I start with the introductory material. Um, and I make time for reading. Like, what, And it was that was encouraged in my family. Like, I always read before I went to sleep. I read... And I, I still do that, um, somewhat less so because I've become so distracted by social media. But uh, you set aside a bit of time every day to read. And for me, it was always just before I went to bed. I go to bed, turn on the light and read for well, when I was a kid for hours. But And if you do something every day, you do a lot of it. And so I would say, well, if you want to read, if you want to make yourself educated, just put aside 20 minutes a day to read or 10 you know, some small amount of time that you could actually steal, not two hours, because good luck, man. It's very unlikely you'll manage that. But 20 minutes a day, you know, that's two hours a week. That's 700 hours a year. You know, that's, even if you're a slow reader, that's a good number of books. And so you make it a habitual part of your life and you decide that it's going to be something that you value. You investigate carefully what resistances you might have to that idea because you might think, well, that's uh, pseudo-intellectual or there's something more productive I could be doing or I'm intimidated by books or I hate books because I wasn't good at reading when I was a kid and was humiliated because of it or, you know, you've got something against intellectuals or, God, there might be all sorts of resistances to picking up a book and then you could listen to audiobooks. That's a good way around that. By hook or by crook, man. So you value it. You make it a regular part of your life. You practice doing it. And and you you need a, a higher goal, too. It's like, well, why should you read? Well, it's so that you're more informed and you can think better. Well, why should you be more informed and think better? Because you won't walk blindly into so many pits. You know, you'll be able to negotiate better in your life because you'll be more informed and more verbally fluent and you'll have a better sense of how the world works and be able to hold your own in conversations and that'll make you more confident. Those are all unbelievably good reasons. It's, to be highly literate is, is an incredibly massive, massive advantage, practical advantage, you know, and, and it, it shouldn't be underestimated. When something happens with a partner or a friend and even a co-worker or, or a supervisor, and you're bringing up all the other times that you've experienced that in the past, that's baggage. When you start your statements about why you do something a certain way or what you're not going to do because of a certain experience, that's baggage. <laughs> and these are just common everyday things. This isn't even the hard stuff. I want to give you some unpacking skills 
for just the common, everyday, normal baggage that we walk around with as human beings. If one person tells you you're a horse, you, you don't have to believe that. If two people tell you you're a horse, you, you may want to listen. But by the time three people tell you that you're a horse, you need to check yourself because I bet you got hay hanging out your mouth and your tail is wagging. <laughs> In other words, if you keep hearing the same thing from different people at different times about you, you need to unpack that baggage and don't hear it as criticism or make people wrong or bad. Ask them what they mean. I remember when my, my grandson told me that I was mean. And, and I had heard that, but I never paid any attention to it because moi, I mean, I'm a Van Zandt. I can't be mean. But when I sat and I listened to him and I realized, wait a minute, he's not the only one saying that to me. I had to hear it and I had to unpack it. So when you hear one or two or three unrelated people telling you the same thing, don't dismiss them. Ask them, tell me more about that because that may be some baggage that I have to unpack. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. If you want to know the seven habits that will make you 1% better daily, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. Everybody's pointing fingers instead of saying, we've had it really good for a bunch of years. And the question is now, what is our competitor revealing about our own weaknesses that we can 